Previously, we looked at how Pokemon's cries were stored and played in the Generation 1 games, Pokemon Red, Green, and Blue. The most common question asked at the end of the video was about Pikachu's cry in Pokemon Yellow. So let's go and take a look at the <coughs> unique sound effects for the player's starter Pokemon in this game. For those of you who don't know what we're about to get ourselves into, let me explain a bit. Pokemon Yellow version, called Pocket Monsters Pikachu in Japan, was released as the final installment of the first generation games. It included an updated storyline that paralleled the Pokemon anime airing on television at the time. One of the main differences being that the player was forced to start with a Pikachu, just like Ash in the show. This Pikachu was special, in that it was the only Pokemon to have a friendship system implemented. It also normally couldn't be evolved into a Raichu. But the most noticeable difference is that its cry is different than the other Pikachu in the game. Your Pikachu had 42 different sounds it could play. The format of these sounds was much different than any of the other Pokemon Cry sound effects. To see just how different, we can analyze the waveform of the sound. With this, we can figure out just how the sounds were compressed from sounding something like this Pikachu! to this. Pikachu! At the top is the original sound, and on the bottom is the sound produced by the Game Boy. From this point of view, the sound looks just like a solid rectangle, but that's just because we're zoomed too far out. But it already has a different shape, it just doesn't look like a stereotypical waveform. Let's zoom in a bit. As we get a better picture, it's starting to look like the sound effect is very similar to a plain old pulse waveform, just without any pattern to it. It turns out that this sound effect has a very low sample bit depth, the lowest possible in fact. A sample's bit depth determines how many different values it can take on. For example, this original sound has a bit depth of 32 bits per sample. This means each sample is represented by a 32-bit number. The total number of possible values each sample could take on is 2 to the power 32, or about 4.29 billion values. This wide range allows for a higher resolution sound, and it sounds clearer. As I drop the bit depth lower and lower, the sound becomes more noisy and scratchy. Pikachu! 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 When we go all the way down to one bit per sample, it means that every sample can either be a zero or a one, and nothing in between. Pikachu! 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 If we were to draw an analog to graphics, this would be like only allowing each pixel to be black or white. Sure, you can still make out an image like this, but the quality will be low and details will be lacking. Before I explain how the sounds were played, I'd like to show two ways in which they weren't. These will reflect my train of thought, how I thought it was done before actually looking into it. The first thing I thought of was just using the wave channel normally. The wave channel isn't used for other Pokemon's cries, but it could be used in this case. This channel also only has a buffer for 32 samples that are normally output in sequence repeatedly to produce a custom-shaped waveform. How can it end up playing a sound that contains over 27,000 samples? My thought was to use the sample buffer as a circular buffer and overwrite the used samples right after they are played. Since the sound would be driven by the CPU, this explains why the game pauses both gameplay and music while Pikachu makes any sound. The processor would be too busy feeding in sound data to do anything else. However, there was one thing that didn't make sense with this explanation, and that is the sound quality. The wave channel has a sample bit depth of 4, so if we reduce the original sound to this quality, it should sound like this. Pikachu! But clearly, it doesn't sound as good as this. At this point, I thought maybe the CPU isn't fast enough to pipe in all of the samples, so it only copies over every other one, or something similar. Well, sound doesn't really work like that, and if you do something like this, very weird high-pitched artifacts start appearing. Pikachu! Pikachu! So that can't be it. It turns out that this method is impossible anyway, 
since the wavetable is completely inaccessible while the wave channel is playing. That was my first guess, but it was before I saw this odd rectangular waveform. The pulse-like structure made me think that either the pulse or noise channels were actually responsible for the sounds, and that the frequency was modulated in just the perfect way to recreate the sound. Well, only the first pulse channel can smoothly change the frequency with its sweeping options, but even then it was limited to linear sweeping. The noise channel can output a pulse-like wave with varying frequencies, but due to the vast range of frequencies it could produce, the ability to fine-tune the frequency to exactly what it needed would be impossible. Not to mention the fact that you can't control exactly when the output of the noise channel is high or low. At this point, I gave up guessing and just looked into the game's code to figure out what was going on. You can find a link to a disassembly of Pokemon Yellow in the description of this video, which is what I use to examine this routine. It turns out the wave channel is used for Pikachu's voice clips, and that the CPU is responsible for driving the sound, just like I initially thought. But the actual method used was limited by the ability to change values over time that were actually possible to access. The waveform data in the wavetable can't be modified on the fly, so it gets set to a simple flat wave signal. All of the samples are maxed out at a value of 15. The volume of the channel is what gets modified, flipping back and forth from max volume to muted in order to create the sound effect. While the wave channel has four different volume settings, 0, 25, 50, and 100%, only two are used for a sample bit depth of 1. The sound data is stored linearly, where each byte made up of 8 bits corresponds to 8 contiguous samples. This data, along with a 16-bit number describing the number of bytes used to store the sound data, is bundled together in the ROM. Those of you who are familiar with sound recording and mixing may be curious what the effective sample rate of the sound effect is. While the wave channel has a potential sample rate of just over 2 MHz, this is when the wavetable samples are used as the effective samples and the highest possible frequency is played. During Pikachu's cries, the effective samples are funneled in by the CPU, and the rate at which they are played depends on the speed of the processor and the efficiency of the code that drives the sample funneling routine. To figure this out, let's take a look at the game's code. Just a fair warning, things are about to get pretty complicated now that we're looking directly at assembly code. This routine is run whenever Pikachu makes a sound, after it is determined which sound he'll make. Prior to this routine, the B register holds the ROM bank number where the sound effect is located, and the HL register pair holds a pointer to the sound within that bank. The first bit of code swaps the correct ROM bank out in the address space so that the processor can access the data for the sound effect. Right here, we grab the first two bytes of the data and store it in the BC register pair. This holds the size of the sound data in bytes, or the number of samples divided by 8. Then we enter a loop that runs for every byte in the data stream one after the other. The current byte we are looking at gets stored in the D register. Right here, we load the constant 3 into A and then decrement it in a timing loop. It basically just wastes time in order to execute the code at the proper rate. There are two subroutines that are used here, one to load the current sample, set the volume of the wave channel, and one to play it for a bit before moving on. To load the sample, the highest bit of the current data in D is shifted over and written to the proper sound engine register, then D is shifted once to prepare for the next sample. To play the sample, the CPU just stalls a bit in another timing loop for the right amount of time. Eight samples are processed per byte, so that's why you see eight instances of the load sample subroutine within the loop. After all eight samples have been loaded, the number of bytes left goes down by one, and the next byte in the stream is loaded in, and the loop repeats. Finally, after all of the samples have been played, the proper ROM bank is swapped back into what it was previously, and the routine exits. In order to figure out the amount of time elapsed between the points in time where the volume of the wave channel is modified, we need to know the cycle counts for each instruction. The cycle count just lets us know how many CPU clock pulses are needed in order to completely execute each instruction. 
Then, we can use the processor clock speed of 4.194304 MHz to calculate the exact time the code takes to run. Here are the cycle counts for each of these instructions. The branching instructions have two numbers. The first is if the branch is taken, the second is if it isn't. The instruction responsible for changing the volume is this write to address hex FF1C, so we'll use that as our start and end point. Now, there are two different code paths between two samples. The first is two contiguous samples in one byte, which is demonstrated between these subroutine calls in this unrolled loop. But every eighth sample, a new byte must be loaded in, so the code run between these samples is different. We'll calculate both times and then use an average if necessary. Let's say the previous sample was just processed and the write to address FF1C is complete. We'll keep a running total for cycles and count them up as we pass over each instruction. It takes 8 to shift D left once, then 16 to return out of this subroutine, then 24 more to enter the other subroutine. This loop can be a bit confusing since the same instructions are run multiple times. 8 cycles to load in the constant 3 to A, then 4 to decrement it to 2. The branch is taken, so add 12 more, then 4 to decrement A to 1, 12 to branch again, 4 to decrement A to 0, then only 8 more since the branch condition is now false. 16 to return, and 24 to re-enter the previous subroutine. 4, 8, 8, and 8 to prepare the sample for writing, and then finally 12 more to write to the volume register. This brings our final total to 180 cycles. Now for good measure, let's do it again, but suppose we are in that last load subroutine call. 8 and 16, like before, but now we continue from this point. 8 to decrement the length counter, then plus 4 and 4 to check if we reached the end of the sound. Assuming we still have more samples to go, it takes 12 cycles to branch back up to the top of the main loop then 8 and 4 more cycles to load in the next byte holding 8 more samples. There's another timing loop here that is actually identical to the play sample routine. So 8, 4, 12, 4, 12, 4, and 8 cycles until we are past the branch instruction. 24 more cycles to enter the loading subroutine, then 4, 8, 8, 8, and finally 12 to wrap everything up. Now oh, look, 180 cycles just like before. This is actually pretty impressive, since this shows that the developers put in the effort to make sure that all of the samples played at a constant rate, without fluctuating every time a new chunk of samples was loaded. This is actually the reason why there is this timing loop that is outside of the play sample subroutine. It takes 24 cycles to call a routine, and 16 more to return back. These 40 cycles would have brought the total to 220, which would probably be noticeable and make the sound effect sound even worse. Anyway, we found that there are 180 CPU cycles between each sample, and we know the CPU's clock speed, so we can find out the sample rate. Just take the clock speed of 4.194304 MHz and divide it by 180, and we get 23.3017 kHz. This isn't too shabby for hardware that isn't designed for driving audio. It's nowhere near the crazy potential of 2000 kHz, but it is high enough to produce a decent sound. Now, is it possible to make Pikachu sound any better in practice? Of course, but the higher the quality of the sound, the more space will be needed to store the sound data. A one second sound clip at 23 kilohertz and one bit depth will require only about 2900 bytes, but at 48 kilohertz and eight bits per sample, it would require 48,000. The low sample rate and bit depth was chosen in the final release of the game as a compromise between quality and data usage. But if we put all of the effort into quality, how good can we make it sound? We are limited by the ROM bank size of 16,384 bytes of space and the CPU processor speed of just under 4.2 MHz. The Game Boy Color can actually double the speed of the CPU, but let's just stick with the original Game Boy's processor speed. Let's see what we can do. First, can we improve the bit depth? Yes, the wave channel allows for four different volume settings, so we can at least double the bit depth to two bits per sample. This will double the size of the sound data, but will greatly improve the quality of the sound. Now that there are only four samples in every byte, we need to modify the code to account for this. 
we cut the number of sample handling calls in half, and then make sure to shift in these two bits instead of one to the wave channel volume register. Second, can we improve the sample rate? Yes, but before we do, let's calculate the maximum sample rate we can have before we run out of data space. 16,384 bytes total, and each byte will hold four samples, so that is 65,536 samples total. Now we have to factor in the length of the sound clip. Let's just focus on one sound clip only. Just know that the longer the sound is, the more it will need to be compressed in order to fit in a single ROM bank. This sound Pikachu. is 0 0.798 seconds long. So divide the samples by time and we get about 82 kilohertz. If we can manage to crunch out a sample rate higher than this, the sound effect won't even fit in the ROM easily. We can divide the processor clock speed by this value to get the minimum number of cycles we have to wait between each sample, which rounds up to 52, much less than 180. All right, so how do we improve the sample rate? We have to trim down the number of instructions, and therefore the number of cycles, between each processed sample. The easiest thing to do would be to just remove all of the timing loops. This cuts down the cycle count quite a bit on its own. You can tell now that the bottleneck will be the code that is responsible for preparing the next data byte every four samples, since it takes up an extra 40 cycles. Second, let's just unpack this subroutine since we learned earlier that a call in return takes up 40 cycles on its own. We'll get rid of the call instructions and copy-paste this subroutine's code where they used to be. This increases the amount of code present but it does run faster since the program counter won't be jumping around as much. The benefit of doing this is that the code that was in the subroutine no longer has to be identical. This means we can trim out some of the redundant instructions at the start and end of the loop, which is great because that shrinks our bottleneck. We can move this decrement instruction that keeps track of the length of the sound somewhere else since it doesn't necessarily need to be at the end of the loop. This is almost as good as we can get, but there's one last minor optimization we can do that can bring the bottleneck down even lower. I will admit that this one is pretty ugly, but it does get the job done. The branch condition that controls when we exit this loop is checking if both the high byte and the low byte of the BC register pair are zero by logically oring them together. If they are both zero, we know we are at the end of the sound and we can stop. The thing is, Checking both B and C requires two instructions. It would be great if we could do this in one. We could check if just B is zero, but that would always exit when we have 255 bytes left to go. This would actually work if we just added 1020 fake samples to the end of the sound data. Unfortunately, we can't check if B is zero in only one instruction because the A register has old data in it that we would need to clear first. Luckily, at this point, there is a way we can check the status of B in just one instruction, but it requires that we use negative one as the ending condition for the loop instead of zero. Which is fine, because we can just offset this counter by one by decrementing it before the loop even begins. When this counter register pair BC hits negative one, its contents will be hex FFFF. Both B and C are hex FF. When you add hex FF to any value that isn't zero, the carry flag in the F register is set, signaling that the sum of the two numbers would roll over into a second byte. We can use the carry flag instead of the zero flag as the operand to the branching instruction, so we can break out when the counter hits negative one. Adding B to A at this point will work in this case, but only if A wasn't zero beforehand and we can avoid that by making sure the last sample in the sound effect data is something other than zero. Okay, that was a lot of work, but I think it was worth it. If we kept the code like it is right now, the average number of cycles would be 52, exactly the limit that was set on us by the ROM bank size. However, let's just throw in some no operation instructions to make the number of cycles between each sample constant. With 56 cycles between each sample, we get an effective sample rate of about 75 kilohertz. This is actually higher than the source sound clip I'm using as an example, and higher than the sample rate of the audio you're listening to on this video. Anyway, 
All that's left to do is compress the sound into this unique format of 75 kHz sample rate and a bit depth of 2. Here is the source sound clip. Pikachu! Here it is compressed to the original format in the final Pokemon Yellow release. Pikachu! And here is the new and improved version. Pikachu! 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 I'd say it sounds pretty good. The high sample rate is probably overkill, since the bit depth is still incredibly low, but the ability to output samples this quickly via the CPU is amazing. It does sound a little scratchy, like the sound is clipping, but that is just an effect of the lopsided volume settings available. A volume setting of 75% would probably make the sound a bit better. If you were able to follow along even a little bit with the assembly here, congratulations! Understanding assembly code and furthermore, assembly level optimizations is incredibly difficult. In fact, I'm fairly confident that there are even more optimizations that can be made here that I couldn't even think about coming up with. Thank you for watching. If you want to hear this improved sound effect in the actual game, I have provided a link to a patch in the video description you can apply to a Pokemon Yellow ROM to hear it for yourself. It halts after the first Pikachu sound, so you can't play any of the game, but it is there as a proof of concept.